Give me a baby, and I can make any kind of man. These are the words of John B. Watson, the founder of behaviorism. According to this worldview, the behavior of organisms, including human beings, is predictable and therefore controllable. In 1920, at John Hopkins University, Watson experimented on several babies ranging in age from three months to a year. The experiments were remarkable in their simplicity. He would present a candle to infants to see if they were afraid of fire. He would introduce animals to their environment to see if the children were afraid of them naturally or only after a traumatic experience. He would make a hissing noise and observe the results. Watson learned that newborn babies had no fear of the dark. He also learned, however, that such fear could be conditioned. And so it was with rabbits. This baby, known as little Albert, initially found delight in touching a rabbit. Yet, as Watson began to clang a steel rod and claw hammer behind the child's head whenever he touched the creature, the reaction became not one of delight, but terror. Soon, the mere sight of the rabbit would elicit fear even when no noise was provided, a fear that also extended to objects and textures of a similar type. From his experiments, Watson reached a radical conclusion which would come to define political and social engineering in the 20th century. The driving force in society, he claimed, is not love, but fear. The sustenance is our conscious energy. And in order for us to feed it to the parasite, the chemical of fear causes humanity to crave protection and defense. The functions of the body to survive can be broken down to two basic functions for any organism to survive. You have to be able to grow, maintain yourself, take care of your biology, but you also must be able to protect yourself so that if you're just growing and you can't protect yourself, you'll become food for something else. So the uh, survival involves a balance between growth and protection. Through the history of human civilization and through a human evolution, we recognize that our nature is to be in a state of growth and that our protection is only supposed to be used to you know, help us out of that, that threatening moment. You can't be in growth and in protection at the same time. So the significance is, when we see a need of protection, the stress hormones in the body shut off the blood vessels in our viscera, or gut, which is the part of the body for growth. Well, the issue is, if you took the blood from the viscera and moved it out to the arms, then you left no blood in the viscera. That means no growth, but you're ready to fight. And when your fighting is finished, then the blood returns back to the viscera and you grow again. But in the world that we live in today, it's 24-7 fear.
So we have a continuous dripping of that stress hormone into the body. It's just dripping all the time, getting us ready to run or fight or flight at any moment at the drop of a hat. We're ready to go because we're on guard. Well, the problem is, what does that mean about your allocation of energy? And it says, we're spending most of our energy in protection. You cannot survive if you're in protection all the time. Nobody who had a blessed childhood becomes an addict. Some people think they had a blessed childhood, but that's only because they haven't looked at what actually didn't work in their childhood. Hmm. Some people have terrible life experiences and they do not become addicted to drugs. Other people do overcome their addictions, despite the fact they have that's terrible true. childhoods. So where does willpower factor into all of this? Willpower is a difficult question to discern because if you actually look at the circuits in the brain that make conscious decisions, they're very weak. And they're much dominated by our impulses, which come from deeper brain centers. And the gap between an impulse and a decision is only a split second. So when you actually look at people who had a lot of negative experiences, but they didn't become addicts, first of all, addiction is not the only outcome. A lot of people compensate for terrible experiences by becoming, quote, really good people. And they end up making themselves ill because they repress so much. And I've written a book about that as well. Other people may have had terrible experiences, but they may have had an opportunity to process it. Maybe there was a sympathetic witness in their lives with whom they could share and at least emotionally resolve the trauma. Then they don't need to become addicts. But the people overwhelmingly who become severe substance users are people that were traumatized early and had nobody there to help them process the experience. What percentage of your patients would you guess overcome their addictions? Or my patients in the downtown east side mm -hmm. in vancouver yes yeah if if i if i could say five percent i'd be hailed as an international genius it'd be less than that less than five percent oh yeah and that's just not that's not only my statistics that's generally true across the board however the question is why not what keeps them and that's we have to come into our society how it treats the addict how it views the addict and how it punishes the addict in the context of what we have right now of social exclusion ostracization and this war on drugs all we're doing is entrenching tens of thousands of people in heavy addictive behaviors in other words we don't have the context to heal or to redeem people we just don't have it they say in baseball if you're a hitter and you fail seven times out of ten you're a star because mm -hmm. you're still getting three hits out of ten mm -hmm. so are you saying that you're not having success with more than 95 percent of your patients but you're still doing really well by by the yardstick of your profession is that right I'm not saying I'm doing really well. I'm saying I'm doing what I'm doing. Under the present situation, the way it's set up, with this war on drugs, and incidentally, there's no war on drugs. You can't war on inanimate objects. What there is is a war on drug addicts. When there's a war on drug addicts, uh, it's very difficult to save anybody. What I do is I treat people's illnesses, I reduce the harm of their addictions and of the social attitude towards addiction. If I wanted to redeem and cure a lot more people, I need a lot more behind me. I need rehabilitation homes. I need this uh, insane and uh, counterproductive war to come to an end. I need resources not up, are not put into uh, into uh, jail facilities and police work to go into treatment. We need a lot more. In other words, we, we could do a lot more. So in the present context, our failure rate is high. If by failure we we define that people give up their addictions. The social values of our society, which has manifested in perpetual warfare, corruption, oppressive laws, social stratification, irrelevant superstitions, environmental destruction, and a despotic, socially indifferent, profit-oriented ruling class, is fundamentally the result of a collective ignorance of two of the most basic insights humans can have about reality, the emergent and symbiotic aspects of natural law. The emergent nature of reality 
is that all systems, whether it is knowledge, society, technology, philosophy, or any other creation, will, when uninhibited, undergo fluid, perpetual change. What we consider commonplace today, such as modern communication and transportation, would have been unimaginable in ancient times. Likewise, the future will contain technologies, realizations, and social structures that we cannot even fathom in the present. We have gone from alchemy to chemistry, from a geocentric universe to a heliocentric, from believing that demons were the cause of illness to modern medicine. This development shows no sign of ending, and it is this awareness that aligns us and leads us on a continuous path to growth and progress. Static, empirical knowledge does not exist. Rather, it is the insight of the emergence of all systems we must recognize. This means we must be open to new information at all times, even if it threatens our current belief system and hence identities. Sadly, society today has failed to recognize this and the established institutions continue to paralyze growth by preserving outdated social structures. Simultaneously, the population suffers from a fear of change, for their conditioning assumes a static identity, and challenging one's belief system usually results in insult and apprehension, for being wrong is erroneously associated with failure. When, in fact, to be proven wrong should be celebrated, for it is elevating someone to a new level of understanding, furthering awareness. The fact is, there is no such thing as a smart human being, for it is merely a matter of time before their ideas are updated, changed, or eradicated. And this tendency to blindly hold on to a belief system, sheltering it from new, possibly transforming information, is nothing less than a form of intellectual materialism. 